All right, I want to do a video of uh, my wife's testimony, actually. I'm not my wife. She's going to be coming here on the camera pretty soon, and you say, well, Brian, I thought you said you weren't ever going to show your wife on camera. Well, we prayed about it, we talked about it, and uh, my wife has a very interesting testimony before she got saved, and I really feel that, that uh, she's felt that the Lord has been calling her to share her testimony, and... Uh, we prayed about it, and I just think now's the time. I don't think there's much time left till the Lord takes us out of here. So she wants to share her testimony, how Jesus Christ saved her. And I just want to give a little warning to you out there. If you're one of my enemies out there and you decide that you're going to make um, some lewd comments about my wife and things, uh, you're going to answer for that. Okay, so that was one of the reasons why I was stopping it. I mean, there's been some really crude things said about my wife and she hasn't even been on film yet on camera yet but uh some people have taken it upon themselves to you know because you aren't going to get to me too easily but they think that they can attack my wife and that that'll scare her away uh she's a little tougher than that and uh i don't want to take too much away from what she has to say so uh without any further ado i know a lot of you are probably wondering what my wife looks like and who she is and everything so Come on over, and uh, she's going to give her testimony. I got to hook her up with the microphone here, real quick. Uh, just give us a minute. I don't have to go like this and talk down or anything. You know, just okay. There we have it. I'm going to go get behind the camera. So careful. Sehr gut. Grüß dich, or howdy, to all of you who speak English. My name is Mrs. Catherine Denlinger, and I wanted to do my testimony because I really hope that the Lord Jesus Christ blesses my testimony and helps all of, all of my saved sisters in Christ and anybody else who's lost who is looking for truth like I was at one point. The reason why it's taken me so long to do this is because, well, to be quite honest and, and blunt, I've been going through a lot of turmoil emotionally. Should I do this because of my past? Should I not do it? But at the same time, I'm thinking, I, I will gladly, without hesitation, die for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm not afraid to die for the Lord if, he, if that's what he wills me to do. You know, I will die for his cause. But at the same time, because of my past, there's always that, do I really want my face online? Because, again, because of my past, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you just why yet. I will tell you here in a moment. But to be more specific, another reason why I waited so long for this was because the Lord has shown me an, an abundant amount of truth ever since I've been saved. And he has given me hardcore truth about why my past is what it is and why things happen in my past the way they did and just it's just it's just amazing what the the truth that he showed me because without it I'd still be wondering why did that happen why did this happen why did I go through that so that's just a little bit of background about my testimony and I don't have the documentation to prove different things I'm talking about right now on hand because that's a lot to carry. And frankly, I'm a little bit clumsy <laughs> with that stuff. But Lord willing, it will come out in the future at the same time that this message is, is uploaded online. And I just, I just really hope that all of you Christian sisters out there will find some blessing in, in my testimony. Alrighty, well, I was born on October 21st on, to, on a large swine farm. Well, I'm kind of modest, I guess, but, you know, it depends on how you want to look at it. But my parents, I was born in the Lutheran Catholic Missouri Synod. I call it the Lutheran Catholic 
Babel building system because that's really what it is. And I'm the youngest of four children. I was also considered the black sheep of a religious family. If you've ever grown up in the Catholic Catholicism system of any denomination, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, you name it, even Roman Catholicism, I'm sure you can understand why I call my former cult Catholic. And so I grew up in Cass County, Iowa, and my kindred is predominantly Bavarian and a little bit of Czechoslovakian, Central Bohemian to be exact, but mostly and predominantly Bavarian. And, and I'm not going to tell you the verses offhand, read them out verse by verse, word for word. Titus chapter 1 verse 16 defines my background being the black sheep of a religious family. And Genesis chapter 10 verse 3, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8, and Acts chapter 17 verse 26 define the kindreds and how they should be separate. That's a biblical standard. My dad was was the county grain elevator business owner for a while when I was growing up, and I have a lot of memories of that. Um, he was also a Navy cryptology officer in the American War, otherwise known as the Vietnam War, you know, because that's essentially what it was, if you read into it. He also is a University of Nebraska college or university graduate, and my mother has been an RN for roughly 40 years or so. And she's been very, very career driven, driven. And she also graduated from what's politically correct as college, but is actually called university. And she graduated from the University of Iowa. And so ever since I was little, my parents were always telling me, you gotta go to college, you need to get a good you need to go to college to get a good degree, to get a good paying job, so you can have a successful career. And once you get a good paying job after college, you can get a husband. Uh-huh, yeah, tried that. I was also medicated, fluoridated, and vaccinated. And ironically, these things led to seizures in my lost life. And praise the Lord, by His grace and mercy, I grew out of these seizures. And I'm sure, you know, people thought, oh, she's not going to amount to much because, you know, she doesn't do well in school. Well, quite honestly, I was extremely bored in school. I hated public schooling. And not only that, but I also endured many years of daycare or childcare and babysitters. But looking back on my babysitter past, it's funny how the Lord worked that out too, because although I was a loner in daycare because I didn't want to be an extrovert, so to speak, I didn't want to go out of my way to socialize at a young age, I actually got along very well with my babysitter, who was a, an elderly woman, the mother of my, one of my mother's best friends from high school. And then my own maternal grandmother, she also babysat me throughout the summers and throughout my childhood. So, and these were two godly women in the sense that, you know, they, they didn't expose me to a lot of the stuff that the public schooling did. But at the same time, they didn't tell me truth, just like the public schooling. So, you know, I had an okay situation there. There were some influences they, they didn't expose me to, but others they didn't tell me about, they didn't warn me about. Well, after that, because of uh, around the age of uh, six years old, my parents took out a life insurance annuity policy on me, which, praise the Lord, my husband and I canceled after, after I got saved because they thought, you know, you got to have insurance from a young age. That's the proper thing to do. And, you know, you got to start early because you can save for your future. Haven't you ever heard that before? Save for your future? Save for your future college? I mean, 
scam? Yeah, uh, interesting how uh, the Bible talks about that because Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 and Luke chapter 16 verse 15 explain clearly about how, how uh, you can't, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24 ends with, ye cannot serve God and mammon. And Luke chapter 16, verse 15 clearly supports that. And unfortunately, that's all I've ever known with having double career, both working par parents. And Jeremiah 46, chapter 11, one of my favorite verses to defy the medical establishment agenda of, your doctor knows everything. Your doctor knows what's best for you. Uh-huh. Right. I was told at an early age that my so-called seizure activity in my brain would never go away and that they would have to do surgery if we opted for that in order to take it away, but even that might not cure it. Funny how the Bible talks about in Jeremiah 46, 11, that you're not going to be cured from physicians. Hmm. Now, and even Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, also talks about the daycare, child care agenda. You know, where in the Bible does it say that women should have daycares looking after their children? And also Philippians chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, talk about what happens when you put me or your self-centeredness, self-righteousness in front of the Bible. It leads to things like insurance policies, life insurance, annuities, accidental death and dismemberment insurance, all sorts of insurance that you don't need instead of obeying God's word. Well, anyhow, I was also, when I was born and raised in the Lutheran Catholic cult, I attended every Sunday service, which by today's standards would be called the cradle-to-grave Catholic system. That's essentially what I would have ended up had the Lord not saved me a couple years ago. I was water sprinkled as an infant. I was confirmed in junior high. I basically went through all the rigmarole of the cult. Received an early 80s NIV Bible. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I may have looked at one or two pages of it or even the entire thing a total of three times in my life, just very briefly skimmed one sentence out of it. And I'm like, what am I reading? This does not make sense to me. And I also served as an acolyte, and I almost always had perfect Sunday school attendance, where, ironically, I learned how to country line dance. Oh, I thought Sunday school was such a good thing. And guess what? You think that's bad? I learned how to drink coffee in Sunday school. <gasps> but I, I thought kids can't have fun without going to church. Well, let me just tell you what fun is regarding my past life. <laughs> oh, and by the way, every time I tried to read my NIV Bible, the early 80s edition, I couldn't understand it and I couldn't memorize it. Nor did I understand what the words meant. Why? Because it's a dead Bible. And outside of that, I also involved myself in bell choir, youth music ministry, like singing, you know, and VBS. VBS was almost a regular summer event for me because it was the, it was the um, motto of, well, you got to go to VBS because you'll learn lots of things at VBS. I went there and I'm learning how to paint a winged devil, which is called an angel in the manger set of the Catholic cult. And I'm thinking to myself, what did I learn? I didn't learn any truth from VBS. Sure, I learned how to be creative and craftsy. Craft craft-like, so to speak, but uh, I didn't learn any truth. And so I even attended two Christian retreats. 
I'm sure you've heard about those, you know, right? Christian retreats. Think about that word, retreat. Retreat from what? The truth? Uh-oh, here we go again. No, actually, my retreats were at Lake Okaboji, Iowa, and the Valparaiso, Indiana, Lake Michigan area, where we dressed up as harlots in bikini swimsuits and stuff like that. Yes, you're actually exposed to that nowadays. It's called retreat, and they call it Christian instead of what it really is. And we actually pretended that we were being rounded up like the Hitler's Holocaust from Germany. We actually pretended that we were, some of us were the good guys and some of us were the bad guys. And we had to devise ways to escape this imprisonment camp. But there's no correlation to what, to what Nazis did in Germany or you know, between that and America. No, there's no correlation. You know, and what did I learn? Nothing. I learned nothing about the truth. And I even took a, a youth group field trip to different places like Adventureland in Des Moines, Worlds of Fun and Notions of Fun in Kansas City. You see what's wrong with this picture? Fun, 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 fun and no truth. Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you see any fun in there? What's fun is when the Lord Jesus Christ saves you from your sin and you have no worries about, well, what about this? Well, how does this apply, you know? I have a question about this situation in life, you know? The King James Bible has all the truth that I've been searching for. Let me continue. So not only on top of that did I, was I exposed to Christian retreats and fun youth group activities, I actually learned to sing the old hymns during the services, which I absolutely loved because every time I sang the old hymns and we had these light blue kind of a, uh, soft cover hymnal books that I grew up with. Of course, after I graduated high school, they threw them out because they were old and gave and put in these new red books that are called hymnal books. And I saw very few, if any, of my favorite old hymns in there after I visited the church on occasion, on occasion after I graduated high school. And every time I, I came across one of these old hymns, I was like, wow, I'm so excited. You know, I get to sing the old, I get to sing the same hymn again. I, I, wanna, I wonder if this hymn is going to be sung today. And I look at the, the, uh, the bulletin board on the side of the altar and I said, why, that's the number I'm, that's one of my favorite songs. Yes, I get to sing the favorite song again. You know, and it always made me happy. But ironically, every single time I went to church, I would be sitting there like this. You know, and my parents would occasionally elbow me to, to stay awake. But for whatever reason, I don't understand what the, what the spiritual uh, goal of, of the Babel building is, but for whatever reason, it always made me fall asleep. And I think the one time I actually did not fall asleep in a sermon Growing up in my Babel building, I went up to the papist wannabe pastor and I enthusiastically said to him one day, I said, guess what? He said, what? I said, I actually didn't fall asleep today. And he had a glare on his face, an angry glare on his face because he didn't think that was funny. <laughs> but anyways... And of course, in Sunday school, I asked deep spiritual questions at an early age, questions that people couldn't answer. And I'd always ask the same question. And the Sunday school teacher, professing Sunday school teacher, would never tell me the truth. He'd just say, oh, well, the Bible says such and such. And because I didn't understand, and I was never exposed to the Bible version issue growing up, I couldn't, I didn't dare to ask, well, which Bible? Because I didn't even know that 
a real, perfect, true Bible existed growing up. I had never even heard about the Bible version issue. All I knew was I was given a 1980s, early 1980s version of the Bible called National New International Version on the bottom in gold letters with my name on it. And of course, I didn't, I was never exposed to the truth. Nobody ever told me the truth. And so, of course, I alienated everybody because I kept on asking questions that nobody wanted to answer. And so, I, of course, went through the motions. But yet, I never heard the gospel. There were things we sung in our matins services, if that's the correct pronunciation of it, or divine service setting, as it's still called to this day, unless they changed it into something else. But they would take all sorts of things out of the Bible, the King James Bible, especially from Psalms 53, if I'm not mistaken. They took all sorts of things out of that and put it in our hymn book and we sang it and I had no idea what we were singing. I had no idea what was going on. So essentially, I, I was raised with a head knowledge of God. I professed to know God, but yet I really didn't have a heartfelt knowledge of, of God and everything that he did to take away my sin. I never ever heard anything about the gospel growing up. Despite people saying, I'm a good person because I go to church. Uh-huh. Right. You go to church and that makes you a good person. Mm -hmm. And yet from a very young age, I also enjoyed talking to older people. Like people, my parents' age, you know, older slash elderly people in my cult building. I can specifically remember this, this older gentleman that my parents were friends with. He spoke German fluently. Now to this day, I can't tell what dialect he was saying, but I do remember him trying to teach me how to say good morning in German. And at the time I'm like, huh? What are you saying? Because that was my first exposure outside of the constant brainwashing agenda of set aside your differences, you know, who are you to judge others? You know, we're all the same, we all bleed the same, you know, who are you to, to say that I'm whatever? That all the public school agenda that I endured. It was constant brainwashing of that instead of embrace how God made you embrace your family heritage. And so outside of the occasional German word that my parents tried to teach, me, to teach me at home, this older gentleman from my Catholic cult building growing up taught me how to say Guten Morgen or, and Guten Tag and you know familiar German greetings like that. But yet that was always pretty much washed away by the public school agenda and all the cares of the world of, what's the latest movie? What's the latest, you know, fashion trend? What's the latest whatever? It was always new, 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 just to push away the old. And yet, ironically, also from a very young age, I abhorred crowds and I detested classrooms and hanging around my peers because every time I went to a family get together growing up, my, my grandparents would play polka music. I don't quite have a, an ear for determining when I hear polka music, if it's from a certain kindred or not, but I do remember hearing the chicken dance song growing up. And every time I heard that song, I would always get up and dance along to the chicken dance song because it was my favorite growing up. And it still is one of my favorite songs to this day. And so that's one of the things that made me happy. Despite all the, the cares of this world, despite all the public schooling agenda and brainwashing curriculum that they tried to ram down my throat all those years, I, it was kind of like polka music and, and listening to older people talk about the past and everything was like a stress-free environment for me. And so, um, but yet throughout 
all that, the Lord taught me also from, from a very young age that, um, that deception is everywhere. For instance, if it's okay, you know, you can, you can get away with sin, essentially. I was told on one hand, you better not cheat on a test. You will be expelled or you'll be expended. You'll be expended or whatever the case may be. And I think it's expelled, suspended. But anyways, you know, I was told all these different rules about if you do this wrong, then this will happen. If you do that wrong, this will happen. And ironically, I saw people cheating on tests in my school years, my early school years, and nothing bad ever happened. You know, I saw them doing all sorts of sins and vexing things. And I'm like, how come they don't get in, get in trouble? But if I say such a bad word, such as, you know, I like polka music, which I didn't, I didn't say that at the time, I don't recall. But if I had said something like, I am well pleased to be a German and I embrace my heritage, you know, the, the school would be like, how dare you say that? You do not say that. So, you know, I had a whole lot of bad influences outside of the little bit of good that my family tried to instill in me. And uh, so basically, and they even told me that the basic, the basic skills test, infamous basic skills test, was supposed to, and supposedly did, reveal how much you learned in the year or over the years in your schooling. And ironically, I didn't really care for that stupid standardized test. So I just simply des decided to make little designs out of my Scantron sheets, which, oh boy, the school was very, very uh, excited to throw me into remedial classes over. And they essentially said, if you don't get your act together and do good in your classes, you know, you're not gonna make it in life. You're not gonna be successful. You're not gonna go to a good college. You're not gonna get a good paying job. You're not gonna do this. You're not gonna do that. And I was like, whatever, you know, I'm bored. At least for a while, I had this resolve to just be like, whatever. And then when I got into high school and I made it through all the other years of brainwashing, <coughs> I mean school, uh, I was told, now we, we have to, we have to tell you that you, in order to get into college, you need to take the ACTs or the SAT, depending on where you wanna to go to college, okay? Because that is an admissions requirement. And if you don't pass that, you're not gonna get into a good college. And there were questions on there that I thought, what, I, didn't, I don't recall being taught this here. I wasn't taught that. There were even things before I got to the test that were asking about my family status, our socioeconomic status, you know, which kindred I'm a part of, if I was Caucasian or whatever they had for choices there. Kind of makes me wonder, why do they need that information just to have you take a stupid standardized test? Really? But guess what? It's actually what's called Nazism in America. They just dumb it down as standardized tests where they aggregate all your personal data to basically, uh, single you out if you don't go along with their agenda. And they call it in disguise as, you're not gonna get into a good college unless you go along with the system. So anyhow, at about the age of 10, I, I ended up committing a, a very grievous sin. I got bit by a dog as a result. And the sin was I disobeyed my, my father. He told me to stay in the truck one day when he had to take care of some hog chores, farrowing swine at a neighbor's farm across town from where I grew up. And because it was cold out, it was pretty warm outside and I was all bundled up for the cold weather and I was starting to overheat in the truck, I opened up the door to get some fresh air and that wasn't enough. And I didn't help me cool off. So I jumped out the door and you know, moments later, I got bit by a dog. Why? Because dad told me, stay 
in the truck. And now I realize that was the Lord speaking through my dad to tell me, stay in the truck, do as you're told. And I didn't understand that growing up, but I do now. And that's just a way of, of showing what sin is. And because of all the different lies and deception I had to go through in my growing up years, I started asking, but why? Why is this the way it is? And I was always told, shut up, but why? You do what you're told, but why? I don't understand. You better shut up if you know what's good for you. That's pretty much the rigmarole of what I endured. And so by the age of 14-ish, um, I think it was, when I was getting ready to be confirmed, in about a year before I was confirmed in my Catholic Babel building, I wrote down in this one little book that we were given, it was called, with a big cross on it, you know, nice blue color, it said, my Christian faith. And of course, Catholic is not Christian. But I didn't know that at the time. And I wrote down one, one time in one of the pages of my book, I said, you know, I get angry when I try to tell people the truth and they get mad at me for saying the truth because they think I'm lying. And they get mad at me because they don't want to hear what I'm saying, essentially to that effect. And you'll see when I, when I bring out the documentation what I said to a T, but that's the gist of what I said. And so ironically, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 16 describes how my sin at the age of 10 was my sin of not listening to my dad tell me stay in the truck because there's a dog out here, you know. I figured what's the harm that could be done, you know. I'm, I'm overheating. The dog's not going to do anything to me. I've loved pets all my life, you know. I get along great with animals. What's the harm, you know? But Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16 explains why what I did was a sin. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and 10, two of my all-time favorite verses in the King James Bible, you know, describes the fact that after this dog bite incident, my parents took out a life insurance policy on me to cover you know, any future events that would happen to me. Essentially saying, I don't believe God can take care of the situation, whatever it may be on down the road. Because 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And if you don't believe me, look at the news of today. Research what insurance means. It comes from Babylon. So, because my parents also, and, and, I, and I'm not saying this because I dislike them. I'm just saying that what they did in my past confirmed scripture. They ignorantly took out, they, they used tax deductions on me. They took out insurance policies on me and a bunch of other financial things on me just to make money off of me growing up. And it actually, that led to arguments between us saying, stop taking, stop using me as a tax deduction growing up. I remember saying that one time. So what am I saying? I'm essentially proving Psalm chapter 49 verses 6 through 12, Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, ye cannot serve God and mammon, and Philippians chapter 2 verse 21. And so after I graduated high school, I attended again more Lutheran Catholic cult buildings, but yet I was never happy. I was always searching for God in my life. And I was always searching like, why is this happening? Why am I never told any truth? Why do people always tell me to shut up when I ask a question? Like, why does this happen? How did that happen? Why do I have to do this? What is the purpose behind this? I was always told, stop asking questions. But yet in school, I was told, sure, you can ask as many questions as you want. But when I did, I was always told, 
that's not for this course. That's beyond the scope of this course, okay? You're gonna have to take the next level or the next class in order to find out the answer to that. So, um, needless to say, uh, I didn't understand what was going on back then, but I do now. And I understand that the Lord Jesus Christ was working out all these fine little details thus far into my lost life, leading up to my salvation. And here's why. Every time I went to my grandparents' house, they would teach me different things. My maternal grandma would tell me, would, would have me help her wash and dry dishes. And because I wasn't there enough to actually memorize every single thing about where the, this type of cup went to, or this type of spoon, or this type of whatever went to, I would always ask her many times, where does this go again? Such and such, you know? And ironically, she was never ever angry whenever I asked her, where does this go again, Grandma? She never yelled at me when I did something wrong. She patiently told me as a reminder, that's where it goes, or I'll show you where it goes. She was very patient with me. I didn't know anything about that growing up. If I, you know, growing up, I always felt like, well, even if I get good grades, it's not gonna be good enough to gain the respect of my parents, you know? Or it's never gonna be good enough to, to gain the respect of my, my school, you know? And when I did get good grades outside of high school, you know, it was always, eh, okay, whatever, you know. It never led to any happiness or contentment. It never led to truth. I was ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But, but on the other hand, my grandparents taught me a, a lot of life skills that have carried on later on throughout my life and looking back all the times that I thought I'm bored I wish I could learn something else it was those hands-on skills like gathering eggs at grandpa and grandma's place you know from the chicken coop or you know riding riding a three-wheeler with grandpa you know learning how to ride on the back of a three-wheeler learning how to take care of the cattle you know the dogs whatever they had at their at their places it was listening to polka music that kept me in a good mood while working on a puzzle. You know, things like that. It was learning how to make a bed from grandma. Learning how to wash and dry dishes at an early age. You know, it was things like that that made more difference and meaning to me than just, okay, I got to learn this by the end of this week, you know. Okay, well, the assignment today is we're going to learn about Martin Luther King Day, you know, and the historical significance of uh, Miranda, the Miranda court case, I forget what it's called, you know, to basically tell you, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say and do can and can and will be used against you in a court of law. I learned about that kind of stuff. I learned about American government, but the public schooling stuff I learned did not mean as much as learning those hands-on skills those outdoor hands-on skills for my grandparents. And, uh, and yet, at the same time, mom tried to teach me some things like sewing and cooking and laundry duties growing up, like how to wash clothes out by hand. I remember her saying, you know, I use this type of soap to wash out stains from wool or stains from cotton. And yet, I never did understand why cotton and wool were such great things until I learned the agenda behind that later on in my lost life years, which I'll tell you about in a, in a bit. But she taught me how to do various types of needle, needlework, like embroidery. Cross stitch is a type of, of embroidery. And she, she tried to teach me how to sew, but unfortunately I got frustrated because I thought, well, I'm just not smart enough to learn this thing because, you know, I had all these other things to keep me occupied. I'm the type of person that I have to keep myself occupied, my hands busy, so my mind doesn't go off daydreaming about things it shouldn't. And that's been, you know, one of my issues all throughout my life. And the Bible talks about that. It calls it idleness. That's what happens 
when a woman be is idle, lots of bad things happen. You can read about that if you don't believe me. But I learned through 10 years of 4-H how to do different hands-on activities like refinish antiques, you know, needlework, photography, how to raise farrow and market swine, how to tell the difference between, you know, uh, a dirty pen, you know, for an individual hog and a pen of three and a clean area, you know. It taught me how to keep my working area clean, you know. And it taught me, I taught, or not I taught, I learned all these different things growing up because it was actually the Lord working through my parents to say, hey, this is what matters in life. Working with your hands matters, you know. But at the same time, they ignorantly went with the world system of, you got to go to college to get a good paying job, and then you can have a great career, and you can get married and settle down and have lots of children. And that never worked for me. Schooling never, ever kept me interested. I was always bored to tears with it. And so, uh, so basically, Proverbs 22, verse 6, and Titus chapter 2, verse 3, explain all those little events that my grandparents teaching me hands-on skills. My mom trying to teach me sewing, cooking, and laundry duties while growing up. And, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, I'm just not coordinated enough for this stuff. What do I need this for? I didn't take it very seriously because of all that brainwashing from the public schooling and the Catholic cult saying, let's have fun! You know, and all this mind-numbing, you know, just completely grievous things that they that they taught me in, in school. Oh, and uh, by the way, guess where I learned the true agenda of friends? It was because of my high school friends that I considered friends at the time that got me into watching porn one day in the parents in the basement of one of their parents' places without anybody around, just the four of us. And they didn't tell me that this is what was gonna happen before it happened. And so unfortunately, my mom allowed me to go hang out with these three people, and that's what they led me to watch. And when I quickly turned away from it because I didn't want to look at it, I was ridiculed by my so-called best friend, who I'm, it doesn't really matter to mention her name to this day, but I'll just say it like this, she called me you know, virgin eyes and virgin ears. And I was called a goody two-shoes in high school because I didn't go out, you know, doing things I shouldn't. I didn't go out drinking. I didn't do drugs in high school. You know, I knew what, was, what, what wine was because that was part of my Catholic cult growing up after I got confirmed. But I didn't do any of that stuff in high school. But unfortunately, I was never taught modest apparel growing up. I was taught, you know, cover up your, this area, you know, your top area, you know, dress modestly. If you dress modest, that means you cover up the upper half of you. But I was never told what that really entailed. So when I got to university after high school, I wore, I wore jeans. I wore jeans since pretty much the first grade. But when I got to university, a uh, magazine salesman tried to stalk me because all because I'm wearing what I thought were modest jeans, you know, not form fitting, just, you know, carpenter, so to speak, wide leg jeans and a modest sweatshirt, my university sweatshirt at the time, you know, just walking to the mall one day to look at a coat. I ended up getting stalked because of so-called dressing modestly. You cannot make pants look modest. I don't care what your reason is. I guarantee you it will lead to sin if you wear pants. There is no right way to do a wrong thing. And let me just show you something why I say that, okay? All right. Tell me, how do, you, how do you call my dress right now? 
How do you describe how I'm dressed? Do you see my physique? Do you see any flesh in, on me other than my hands and the little you can see from here on up? Okay, that means I'm dressed modestly. And here's why. If you wear culottes, those are still pants. If you wear, you know, so-called wide leg jeans, those are still man's pants. And the whole purpose of these trendy fashions that are in the world today, like jeans of all sorts, pants of all sorts, you name it, it's to show off flesh. And flesh is talked about extensively in the King James Bible. Okay, what am I saying? I'm saying I can go take a walk up and down a mountain. I can walk up and down this entire hill, you know, in exactly what I'm wearing. I do it all the time. I can kayak in what I'm wearing. And you know what? I can actually ride a motorcycle in what I'm wearing. And when I, when I sit down, this is a really big test. The Lord showed me this over the years. When you're sitting down and you have on a tight form-fitting skirt, I don't care if it's, you know, down to here and if it's form-fitting, it's immodest. If it's just at your knees and it's form-fitting, form-fitting in any way, regardless of the length or style, it is immodest. And when you sit down, I want you to do this test, okay? Watch. Did you see my knees? Any, any part of my legs at all when I sat down? Did you see any part of my lower body outside of my jean skirt and my socks and shoes when I sat down? Okay. Right. You did not see any part of me that wasn't supposed to be exposed. Okay. If your skirt or your dress does not cover both knees when you sit down, you are in sin. You are immodest. If you stand up and if you're sitting down and the back of your shirt does not cover this or this, that's immodest. Here's a really, really interesting factor of all this. If you're sitting down and you have to bend down just a little tiny bit for whatever reason, you know, to look at something, to bend down and do something, if your shirt goes whoop out like this and you can see down it because you don't have a, you're not covered up like I am, I don't care who the person is, I don't care how strong they are as a saved man or woman, their eyes will almost immediately go and then you see women doing this to cover up. They shouldn't be doing that. You know, if, if you have to cover up this part, you know, when you bend down, you're in sin. You are immodest. When you go out to town or you go out in public outside of your home, you know, put gas in your car, whatever you're doing, and you're wearing pants, I want you to do a little experiment, okay? If you don't believe what I'm saying about this, because my lost life, the Lord has shown me through my lost life that unless you're wearing a modest skirt or dress, you will be treated like a man. And if you don't believe me, try this little two week experiment, okay? Take one week and and uh, see if you can make it through one week of wearing a modest dress or a modest skirt, modest outfit like what I'm wearing, okay? See if you can handle one week of that and observe what goes on around you. Observe it, okay? And then try one week with your trendy apparel, whether it be pants, modest or not, and whatever else you want to wear that's trendy and observe what happens. Then you'll see. But as I continue, you know, 
I tried very, very hard when I went to public schooling growing up to fit in. And it never made me happy. It always led to torment, depression, anxiety, and I never succeeded. Why? Because Romans chapter 12 verse 2 explains it. And yet, in all my years of public schooling, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 7 explains why I, I never fit in and how the ends justify the means, which is essentially the Hegelian dialectic. And despite my extreme shyness in, in my early school years, people tried to mold me into an extrovert. You gotta socialize with people. You can't be a loner. You need to have friends. And, you know, on the, at the same time, I, was, I had extreme attention to detail because that's how the Lord made me. And I'm a very meticulous person. When I get focused on a task, I, have, I get tunnel vision and everything else drops to the side. And that led to my teachers telling me, you're taking it long. You gotta work faster. You know, after they gave me the initial standards for a task. And so right there, I spotted the lies starting in elementary school. And despite wearing dresses in kindergarten, by the time I got to first grade, because I was trying hard to fit in, was when I started wearing pants. Even though I almost always wore a, a dress, you know, of some sort to my Catholic services and events. But then, when I got back to school, public brainwashing essentially, you know, I was always reprimanded and sent to the principal's office for speaking truth in certain situations. And I would speak my mind about things and, and voice my opinion and they'd throw me into trouble because I wasn't conforming to their system. And uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 28 explains uh, the fact that proves that goes along with the fact that I was wearing pants and jeans regularly once first grade began. And so um, outside of school, because my siblings were involved in sports and, among, and other extracurriculars, I said, I want to be like my sibling, you know, in whatever area it was. I wanted to be like my older sister and, you know, music things. So I got involved in jazz, tap, ballet, and tumbling classes for a number of years growing up. And I never enjoyed that. And now I understand why. Because God didn't make me, you know, didn't create me to be this infamous ballet dancer, tap and jazz and, and gymnast. He, he designed me to embrace how he made me according to the kindred he made me to be, which doesn't include all, the, all this extracurricular nonsense of athletics, you know, but I didn't, I didn't know that. Nobody ever told me growing up that that stuff was wrong and that I should have just embraced how, how uh, he designed me and how my family, you know, enjoyed their, their polka music and all their cultural traditions. And um, so, anyways, I, it, my meticulousness and my extreme attention to detail growing up led to, um, led to me finding spelling errors in my teacher's instructions on the homework assignments. And that led to, you know, some ill feelings because I was, in a way, bucking the system because I would find their errors. And... Um, and yet, despite all that, I got into to sports, which made me a very, very aggressive person. And uh, it made me extremely, extremely uh, distrustful of other people and competitive. And it, and it made me just, um, you know, in a, in a way, it made me extremely prideful because every time you get involved in sports as a woman and you say, oh, there's nothing wrong with my, with my children getting involved in sports. It's Christian. 